Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Hello, my name is Harmony Lott, and I serve on staff as an associate minister with Family Ministry. Our passage today is, <laughs> thank you, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one, the Spirit is given, uh, sorry, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the other the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. And to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Harmony. Hey, good morning. Don't be nervous about that text. We're going to dive in. You're going to be fine. All right? <laughs> Hey, just briefly as we unapologetically, unapologetically dive into the book, um, it, it struck me that like one of our worship leaders were like, I found a parking spot and then I didn't get turned away. And then, so it might be helpful to, to maybe lay in front of you that we actually are working a plant. Uh, we've gutted our executive suite to make space for fourth and fifth graders. Uh, we think that age group requires its own kind of, you can't put a first grader with a fifth grader and, and, and do that well. So we've gutted our executive suites where actually the whole staff is like three to an office upstairs. It's as awful as it sounds. And um, we're going we're gonna, to, that, that'll be our way of doing things for the next couple of years while we work this thing out. So that's phase one. It's already working. We do have plans for this corner that we bought uh, all those years ago. And we're going to start to roll those out for you. We know it's hard to get in. We know it's hard to get out. We know um, that even the most mature and godly among us will find their faith tested uh, trying to get in and out of here. Uh, and so thank you for your endurance. We do have a plan. We are working that plan. That news will be coming uh, soon, but we've already started by gutting the executive suites. All right. So we are moving forward. So hopefully one day, maybe. That's all I got for you. All right, now, um, in the late fall and winter of 1819 and 1820, a 77 year old Thomas Jefferson uh, bought a Bible uh, and bought a razor blade. And then over that period of time, he, he sat with the Bible in his hand, specifically the four Gospels is what he was looking at. Uh, and he went line by line through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and cut out any reference of the miraculous, any reference of the deity of Christ, and anything other than the moral teaching of Jesus. And then he published that. The actual title of that release was The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. What it's actually called now is the Jefferson Bible. And you can find a copy of it in the Smithsonian. You can also find a co co copy of it at, at the Museum of uh, the Bible. And, and what you're looking at in, in 1819, 1820 is kind of the, the, the kind of apex, maybe not the apex, but almost the apex of the Enlightenment. Uh, and the Enlightenment was this idea that there was a natural, reasonable explanation for anything. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson was very much in that line. I don't think he was trying to save Christianity because I don't think he was a Christian, but he did see in Jesus what a lot of people see in Jesus, some wisdom for life, some morality that meant if we would kind of listen to it and line our lives up with it, good things might happen for a, a town, a city, a nation. So, so Jefferson believed that, but he didn't believe in the deity of Christ. He thought miracles were hogwash. And so he, he presented to the world the Jefferson Bible. Now, you and I, in, in the times that God placed us, we are going to repeatedly find ourselves smashing against this kind of thinking in our day and age. In fact, uh, I find it sad that, that so many Christians would probably, with their mouths, 
Well, like testify that God is able, testify that they believe in the miracles, like read the creeds of the church that a virgin gave birth to the son of God to, to embrace the, the incarnation of Christ, to celebrate miraculous things and then live like none of that's available to them. And walk like all of that's yesteryear fairy tales. To look back even on those things that we see in the scriptures as some sort of moral fable rather than permission to play. And you will not, because of how we're designed, you will not push the supernatural to the fringes. We are supernatural creatures living in an enchanted world. And the more we push that to the fringes, the, frig- fringes, the more it pops up in other places that are far more demonic and deadly. So I don't know if you've noticed, while the Enlightenment pushes all that to the fringes, you're, you're seeing a crazy rise in new age practices, like rocks and crystals and energies and manifestations and certain types of yoga. Don't email me, I'm going to India on Wednesday. <laughs> and, and this mindset globally belongs only to the West. Look at me, this mindset that the world's not enchanted, that there's not anything supernatural, just give us enough time and we'll find the explanation for it through natural means belongs only to the West. I'll get on a plane to India on Wednesday. I will not find this there. I have been to multiple places in Africa. You will not find this here. You will not find that in Asia. They believe in an enchanted supernatural world where there's a God or something behind everything and we're in desperate need to be in relationship with that. It's only in the West. We're like, I mean, maybe, but probably not. And, and the more we don't fight against that and understand we really are weird, enchanted, supernatural people involved in a weird enchanted world, the more we take a step out of what God has for us to walk in as something I believe is more normal than than most of us believe or embrace, right? And that's what Paul's getting after in this passage here. And by the way, one of the reasons, some food for thought, one of the reasons that secular people and, and God helps some of you Christians who are screwing around with things that are evil and demonic, but you'd think they're cute, um, those things like tarot cards and astrology and, and manifestation and, and energy and all that, it's real. It's tapping into the supernatural. Man, you just don't know what you're screwing around with. Inviting stuff into your life, inviting stuff into your home, inviting stuff into your, that's going to wreak havoc on you, and you won't even know how it started or where it came with when you're piddling around with what the Bible clearly calls demonic. And so it's important for us to understand the enchanted world we're in, and it's also important that in the collision of the enlightenment air we breathe, that we hold fast to, no. No, there's something more than what we can see, smell, touch, taste, weigh, see under a microscope or explain through through rational means. There's more than that, and I know you know it, but I want you to know it, know it, like guts know it. You with me? All right, and this passage is one of those that's trying to lead us to understand, hey, there's more available to you than you're playing around with. And so I want to try to give us some confidence today in this. So let's look, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to pick it up in verse 7. I'm going to step away and make a quick rant. That's not what I've done so far, that's just preaching. I'm going to step over here, I'm going to rant, then I'm going to come back, we're going to dive into the text and get into where we need to go today. Okay, here we go. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. On Thursday night, I flew to Boise, Idaho, right? Which sounds beautiful. There are better parts of Idaho. And flew to Boise, and I was speaking at a conference. And one of the things they asked me to do Uh, We were talking about the future of the church, and they were asking me to kind of explain our model of church and the pros and cons of that. And and one of the primary cons that that I just candidly shared with this crowd was that for whatever beautiful, good, amazing things God has done at the village over the last 20 years, we have still been unable to to unlock the consumeristic mentality of the suburbs that has everybody believing that all the volunteers and everybody else are here to serve them and to see spiritual formation simply as a them and Jesus thing that never requires them to sacrifice and serve anybody else. And he, the apostle Paul, the good book, is saying, no, no, no. 
to each one, look at me, even you, there is given a manifestation of the Spirit, something of the Spirit. For what? For you? Not for you, for us, for the common good. Which means we will never be fully we until you deposit into this community the good gift that God put in you for our sake. And so we are constantly... We are constantly staffed and driven by this 15, 20% of people that are serving everywhere. Everybody else is eating popcorn and not getting in the game. And the rebuke from this text should be to you. You will not mature in Christ as long as you see your maturation as just about you and the Bible and some prayer time. That you will grow when you die to yourself over and over and over again and you will grow in gladness when you understand all the gifts of your life have been given to you for others' sake and not for your sake, for the glory of God and, and our good as a community. And, and so I had to just be honest. I've been here 20 years. We can't unlock the thing. I mean, I do stuff like this all the time where I'm intentionally and, and in a funny kind of way rebuking you. And you'll be like, yeah, and then it'll just stay. And I'm just confessing to them, I don't know what to do. The latent potential in this room drives me nuts. The latent, sleepy, lazy, sit on our hands and watch other people serve the kingdom keeps me up at night. Good God, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? You're not going to mature in gladness and, 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 and zeal for the Lord as long as everybody exists to rub your shoulders into maturity. To each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Look, this is me. I, I need you. We need you. How the Lord gifted you. We don't need you to play where you're not gifted, but you were given a gift. And maybe you're not serving because you're like, well, I just don't think I'm mature enough. Nobody's, but you mature by serving. You mature by dying to yourself. You don't mature by constantly going, serve me until I get mature. That's not how this works. Back to this service. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. If you're new and you're looking at your neighbor and like, is that normal? Sometimes. So, <laughs> for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. We won't cover that today, but that's awesome. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Oh, we're talking about that. To another, gifts, plural, of healing by the one Spirit. We're talking about that. To another, the working of miracles, getting into that. To another, prophecy, one day. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, super important, not today. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. You're all right. You're all right, one day. <laughs> now, here's what I want to highlight. Three gifts that awaken us to the supernatural. Gift number one, the gift of faith. Let, let me give you a definition of faith from um, a Bible dictionary. The gift of faith is the ability to envision what needs to be done and to trust God to accomplish it, even though it seems impossible for most people. So uh, when you think about faith, in fact, you, you even, like, you'll ask people, do you have faith? I have faith. Uh, like, this is not talking about salvific faith. You tracking with me? Like, to be a Christian, you have to put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. So I am a Christian because by faith, through grace, gra faith alone, grace alone, I believe that the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, or second son of God, descended, put on flesh as Jesus of Nazareth. He died on the cross, absorbing all of God's wrath towards my sin so that I am fully, freely, and forever forgiven by the King of glory. By faith, I believe that. That, that kind of frames my, my whole understanding of the universe, that I've been purchased by the death of Jesus Christ and now I've been adopted into his heavenly family. I'm a child of God. That, I believe that by faith. That's not what this is talking about. This is not salvific faith. This is something else. This is a, a gift given to people who have seen God, gazed upon God, seen God came through, studied his word and seen his promises. And they are not only hopelessly optimistic, but they are often annoyingly optimistic. Right? Just doesn't matter what happens. All they see is an opportunity for God to show off. You know anybody like this? It's just like, it's stage 42 pancreatic cancer. And they're like, whoo! God's going to, well, God's going to show off his face on this one. Like, it's just, 
They just don't seem to ever be moved by any kind of wave or brokenness. They only see opportunities for God to show off. It's the gift of faith. Just come what may, he's got it. He's the king of the universe. He's the sovereign of glory. What can't he do? What is too hard for him? This is their whole, like they just got that thing. I want that thing. Like I, I ain't got as much as I want. Maybe you do. I, I, sometimes I'm like, like sometimes I, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I, because of how I'm wired, it, it's both gold and shadow, man. It, it's like I, I'm skeptical by nature, which actually lets me dig and understand and want to understand things clearly and, and get it so we can all kind of celebrate it together. But then I, that, that skepticism also sometimes when we go, but really? Like oftentimes the first thing I'll do when we're praying for the sick, if, if there's a group with me, is we'll take a couple of moments and just confess our doubts. Stage four, pancreatic, and they've sent you to palliative care. Do I really believe that God can right now in this moment heal you? Like, miraculous, in this moment, do I believe that? Here, look at me. Sometimes, no. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I mean, I hope. And so I just want to stop and go, hey, man, i am got some doubts here right now. I don't want those doubts, Lord. Will, will, you, will you increase my faith? And, and I'll lead the room to, to pray prayers like that just quietly before the Lord, before we even pray for the sick person. Let's, by the grace, ask him to increase our faith. It's a gift. And it's a gift the Lord loves to give. And I don't know about you. I, I want to be, be annoyingly optimistic. I really do. I'd rather be that than the other play. Right? I'd rather be that than the other play. So there's the gift of faith. And then he says next to another by the same spirit, the gift of healings, right? Now, th this word healing here simply means to make solid or whole. And when the Bible talks about healing, it, it almost always is addressing um, making something whole. So it's a, a better way to think about it is that when we, have, we see the gifts of healing rolled out, uh, what we're seeing is that God's desire that through his people, that, that men and women are made complete or whole. And so uh, is he talking physically? Absolutely. But is he talking emotionally? Oh, yeah. What about psychologically? Uh-huh. Like all of it to make whole, to make complete, to make right. That, that's what healing is and the gift of healing. So those with the gift of healing trust that God can heal the sick and pray in faith for the physical, spiritual, emotional, and psychological restoration of those who are in need. Now, these people see healing as a sign of the kingdom of God breaking unto darkness. That's how they see and understand healing. And so they believe that since Christ is reigning and ruling and the kingdom of God is at hand, that the kingdom's going to break through. And by faith, they believe that the kingdom's going to break through in this moment for this person with this disease or with this mental illness or with this whatever. And they're going to boldly pray, believing that Christ would do it. And sometimes he does. Can we be honest? Not as much as we'd like, but sometimes he does. Now, one of the things that I'm not, I didn't write this sermon as kind of an apologetic for people who don't believe, they believe all this stuff stops, so I'm not going to address it. It's so silly, but um, like when, when you see this gift of healings, one of the things I've heard is like, well, why don't you just go empty out a hospital then? Got the gift of healing. Why don't you just go to a hospital and empty it out? But one, that's not what's happening in the text. and It's not what happened in the New Testament. Even people with profound healing gifts, like woke up dead people kind of healing gifts, had people they couldn't heal, right? So um, it, let, me, let me give you some of this. It, one, it, the fact that this is gifts of healing uh, is it, simply talking about these moments where the kingdom does break through, through specific people who by faith believe in this. Like they, they've, got a kind of, uh, they've got a kind of faith where they're just, if you're like, hey, I'm not feeling well, their answer is not, hey, have you tried, uh, have you tried this thing that you can swab in? Have you tried some Zycam? They, they want to pray. Like, they just want to pray, and they just want to pray because they believe that God will do so. In fact, have you ever been prayed for somebody, and then they just, like, stopped and asked you if it worked? Anybody experienced that yet? Like, man, my back's hurting, and then they pray, and they're like, how's that feel? <laughs> well, I still got a little hitch. Oh, okay. And you're like, okay, uh, I... I've only got a little bit, yeah, go ahead and pray again. Like, what, what's that? They're expecting that God's doing something there. And man, they might pray for you 42 times. You might have to literally be like, does this work if I head to my next meeting because I, I'm going to be late? And then, right, it, what is that? That's people who, f with faith, believe that the kingdom will break through. They just, by faith, they believe it. It's going to happen. It's going to break through. And, and it doesn't always 
In fact, I, I love the Apostle Paul as an example because he had such powerful healing gifts. In fact, the, the Bible told us that, that his handkerchief and apron would heal people. Right? That's a pronounced gift, right? When, when somebody just like steals an article of your clothing and lays it on a sick person, that sick person's healed. I, I've met a lot of people. I ain't met anybody with that kind of gift. And yet we read in the scriptures, we read in Philippians 2, that Epaphroditus almost died while he was with Paul. Well, why, Paul? Just heal him. You think Paul wasn't praying for Epaphroditus to be healed? Well, gosh, what's going on here? It seems like the Lord's up to something bigger than Paul. And then there's Timothy, who according to the Bible is like, it's like Paul's spiritual son. And Paul has to write to him, hey, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. Like, wait, so the Apostle Paul can raise a dead person, but he's having some, some trouble with gut health, right? We, we got a little antacid going on here. We got a dead guy here, so that dead guy gets raised, and, and your boy who you love dearly, you're just telling him to basically, you know, take a Tums? Like, what, what in the world's happening here? And then, and then you've got Trophimus in 2 Timothy 4. He's sick. You don't think Paul's pleading with God to heal Trophimus? So, so how are we to make sense of these things? Well, I, I think it is God who heals, and it's not people. Because it's God who knows, and it's not people who know. And then we move to miracles. A miracle is, again, Bible Dictionary help, an extraordinary event that goes against nature, cannot be explained by science, and that Christians believe is caused by God. Right? So he, here's what happens. Here's the, here's the rub between uh, kind of secular enlightenment and Christian faith. Um, secular enlightenment sees the gap and thinks that one day we'll understand what that was, but we don't right now. Like one day we'll understand, but we don't right now. We look at it and go, dang, God's amazing. And we give credit for the miracle to God. Where, where kind of a, a, a secular um, person might have to think of something to call it, like, you know, spontaneous remission, you know, I don't know. And they have to kind of think of a way to one day we'll know. And, and, and here, I understand why they know it. When the Enlightenment hit, things that the church had always said, this is just God, there is no natural explanation of it, actually we started to see that there was natural explanations for some of the things that God was getting credit for. But, but I think to look at it that way is a little skewed. And, and basically, if I could be so bold, and since I'm going to India, not worried about the avalanche of emails this might get me, this is where sometimes I, I miss, or I don't miss because I never was, this is where sometimes the, the Reformation hurt us in regards to theology because the Catholics have a whole category of thought called common grace. They hear it about a lot. We just rarely hear about it. And the idea of common grace is that God in his mercy has given to all human beings everywhere the common graces of man. So that we would say, the way to think about it is, is that doctors and medicine and MRI, all of that is a good gift of God's grace to all humankind, even if they hate him. So the one that hates Jesus has still been given by God the common grace of chemotherapy. That he's been given by God the common grace of anti-inflammatories. Been given by God the common grace of, so that Christians rightfully still consider healing through natural means a miraculous gift of God's grace, all right? And so now, that's not what this passage is talking about. This passage is talking about the miraculous healing that didn't come from surgery or medicine or doctor. This is that supernatural healed that, that can't be tied to natural means. And, and then the next is miracles, which also goes the same way. That these are not the miraculous where you think about uh, and and. A320 jet double-decker plane that can fly for 18 hours in the air, which is a miracle. Like, have you ever thought about that? Do you fly? You get on a plane and be like, what is happening? And this thing's like 200 tons and we're at 35,000, 42,000 feet, which is something I never like to think about. Like, that's every time. I have yet to get over flying. Every time they punch that thing, I'm like, woo! I mean, I love it. It's a miracle. But this isn't what that's talking about. This is God breaking through the natural order because he can without wearying himself at all. He can make every cell line right back up like it's supposed to. If you watch the life of Jesus, he told a storm to stop it and it obeyed. He told a dead little girl to stop being dead and she popped up. 
cursed a fig tree and it shriveled. How about this one? Rose from the dead. Like he's got, he's got some stuff going on outside the natural order, right? And, and does it, it never gets weird. He doesn't get tired by it, right? He, he just is outside of time and space. He created all things. He's the God of all things and he can do whatever he pleases. And so we believe that our God is a wonder working God, a miracle accomplishing God. That despite all the heartbreak of the world, we believe our God is in there doing miraculous miracles, healing men and women, and doing all for the glory of his name and the encouragement of his children. And, and sometimes these miracles and healings, they lead people to an intimate relationship with Christ, but not always. So even if you're in here today and you're not a believer, if you're like, if I could see a miracle, then I think I would believe. I would just lay before you that my entire Bible is filled with people who thought that way, saw the miracle, enjoyed the miracle, and never surrendered their life to Jesus. In fact, Jesus even said, it is a wicked and perverse generation that demands a sign. So what does that mean for us at the village? This means we're, I'm just, I've never tried to hide it. We're a little ghosty here. But let me tell you what that looks like. We are gonna build everything and orient everything here around knowing, loving, seeing, celebrating, worshiping, and cherishing Jesus Christ. So I'm not interested, although we've created space. You know, you come to Encounter, we're praying for sick at Encounter. You come, we are creating space for these kinds of things to be celebrated, to be grown into, to be the, like the whole discipleship pathway here, the whole discipleship process is, because we believe it, because it's what the book says, if you will grow into the fullness that God has for you in Jesus Christ, if you will look at Jesus and love Jesus and savor Jesus and worship Jesus, then miracles follow. You never chase miracles and signs. You chase Jesus. And when you're chasing Jesus, they'll catch up to you. That's what we believe. So churches that orient around the miraculous or orient around the gifts fail because they're meant to orient around Jesus and treasure Jesus and chase Jesus knowing that this might pop off. And so, um, in my 20 years here, it's not uncommon for us to see this happen, like miraculous, crazy stuff. So even the most recent, um, uh, Roger and Linda Lowe, who he's a deacon here. If you've ever taken communion with us, you, you did it because he put it in your hand, all right? Or his team did. Uh, well, man, she was diagnosed with cancer and then we we prayed and we gathered around her and we just asked the lord to heal her and, and the the chemo and treatment worked and we were like praise god because i said we own that if it's true it's ours we own it yeah praise god for the common grace of chemo and surgery and and recovery praise god and, and then uh, th there was something that happened in that as she recovered where her like her back was killing her so she went and had an mri and it revealed like some of her vertebra had been crushed but they also found just her her back covered in cancer and so put her on palliative care, told her to gather um, her family and share the news that they gave her nine to 12 months. In fact, her son uh, and grandbabies were in the last service. And I wanted her to come up and share that even live. But again, the, the, the crushing of her vertebra made it very difficult to sit for any amount of time. In fact, I'm gonna show you a video. I got to sit down and interview him. Um, but you'll see, because we had to adjust chairs in the video, I'm closer to the camera. So I'm gonna look like I'm from Gath. I'm gonna look like a giant of a human being. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not. I'm this normal size. But let me show you their testimony real quick. I'll be right back. Well, here I am with Roger and Linda Lowe. They've been at the church for a long time. In fact, uh, Roger's a deacon here when you take communion every week. In fact, how many communion cups do you think you've handed out here over the years? My best guesstimate would be about 1.3 million. <laughs> okay. So... You can tell the kind of mind that Roger had. That, that's yeah. So he he kind of runs the team uh, that makes sure uh, everybody has the Lord's Supper uh, as we gather each week. And I believe it was uh, this past summer uh, where news that that Sweet Linda had esophageal cancer, um, and and that's not uncommon at the village to hear that that somebody we know, somebody we love, somebody who's a big part of the community um, has um, cancer. Uh, and so we just immediately began to pray for Linda and ask the Lord for healing grace and, and, and power. And I, it, was, it was evident that God had put a great amount of faith on you guys to just trust him. 
So talk a little bit about um, what the diagnosis was, how that hit the two of you, uh, and then maybe a little bit of um, how you handled treatment in, in the early, um, early part of uh, the diagnosis. So the diagnosis was esophageal cancer, and the, uh, it was like in the mid, middle in the, part? In the middle, mid to lower part of her esophagus. Okay. So then they treated me with uh, chemotherapy and um, radiation, and then about a month after I was done with that surgery where they um, cut out the tumor and then pulled my stomach up okay. to be part of my esophagus. And I was supposed to spend 10 days in the hospital. I spent 23 days yeah. in the hospital. <laughs> and it's been a long road to recovery. From that surgery. Yes. And, and then, but it looked like those things were working, right? It, yes, it looked like they were working. And so... So here we are again, it's it's one of those things where, again, it's not uncommon to, man, get these this good news. And so we actually began to celebrate, oh, praise God, common grace, medicine is a common grace of God, radiation, a common grace of God, surgery, a common grace of God given to all human beings, whether they know him, love him, whatever, it's just a gift to his creation. And so we actually began to celebrate that, oh my gosh, he's heard our prayers. He's worked through these means and it looks like, man, we've got a, we've got a story of, of recovery and now, now we're going to move into the part of the story that's redemption and then man then then we got bad news so talk a little bit about the when it looks like oh no it, it, it didn't work as well as we thought or oh no it's back in force or talk a little bit about that news and, and when you got it and, and how you were processing that yeah. well the about two weeks or so after she got out of the hospital she started getting intense back pain just across her lower back from side to side like on a scale of nine out of 10, okay. just really intense. That went on for about three months and uh, they finally did an MRI. They found out that she had three fractured vertebrae and two that were sketchy, possibly fractured. But they also found that she had spinal cancer. Okay. And we were told at that point that it was stage four um, terminal and they said that she would have nine to 12 months to live. Okay. Yeah. And that was a shock. Yeah. <laughs> a bit yeah. of a shock. At least. Yeah, I bet. And, and so treatment protocol for that or no treatment protocol for that at the time? The doctor said it would be palli palliative and not curative. In okay. other words, keep the pain meds such that she would be conscious and, and healthy, but low enough to keep the, well, just keep her comfortable. Sure. And, and so you enter palliative care, yeah. uh, trying to keep her comfortable. And then were they, how are the doctors like telling you to move forward? Or are you like, get your house in order? Is that basically the conversation the doctors had with you? Basically. And, okay. and he wanted to do chemo and radiation immediately. Um, but before he did that, he wanted to do a PET scan. Okay to see the extent of the cancer. He, he saw it in the MRI in her back, yeah. but it could have been spread throughout her body. He okay. didn't know. So, um, so he scheduled a PET scan for about 10 days after the diagnosis. And on the morning of the PET scan, I've set up a carrying bridge for Linda for yeah. uh, people to pray and thank you all for praying. <laughs> yeah. I know there've been so many of yeah. you praying. Uh, and on that morning, the Lord prompted me to put out a request for everyone on the Caring Bridge and my home group and, and yeah. everyone I could think of to pray for Linda's healing that day and that the PET scan would come back clean. Yeah. And so many people were praying. Uh, they responded. And that afternoon, Linda. Right. <laughs> I, we, I did the PET scan. It takes almost an hour to get home from UT Southwestern. Okay. Walked in the door, the phone rang, it was a doctor. He said he had the results of the PET scan and it was clear. Yeah. And his, he was stunned. Yeah. Just, I could tell, he didn't know what to say. Yeah. And you know, that was, so you don't need chemotherapy and radiation. Yeah, not if you don't have cancer. <laughs> That's right. But, but they also wanted to, just, just to rule it out, you know, they see it in the MRI, they're not seeing it now in the PET scan got a history of cancer. So we're going to, let's go do a biopsy, right? right? That was the next step. That's and, right. Um, and so how long do you have to wait between getting the news that, hey, you're cancer free 
But we want to be sure. About two weeks. Okay. Before so, the biopsy occurred. So what's that two weeks like in your own kind of faith? Are you are you anxious there? Are you so I mean here you got you, you've been healed miraculously and but but maybe not. So you, yeah. you gotta wait. So what what's that what's that few weeks or that couple weeks like? For me it was interesting because I went out on the afternoon and I told everybody that she had been healed. Yeah. In faith. Just threw it out, just went, just went. Just went with it. Yeah. Because there it was there. So I had thoughts of okay, well, what if the biopsy doesn't come back right? Well, then I'm going to look pretty foolish. Yeah. But then I thought, I don't care. I'd rather be a fool for God yeah. than not to say that he healed her because yeah. he did. Um, but I also felt like I was one of the lepers between, and I, Linda and I yeah. have been married 54 years, so we're <laughs> one. Okay. When I say I, I'm... We. Anyway, you mean we. we. Yeah. I felt like one of the lepers between Jesus healing him and going to see the priest. Because as they went, you know, were they thinking, gee, when I open my robe, is it going to be leprous or is it going to be clean? Yeah. And I kind of felt the same way. Um, but I, I found myself um, asking God to forgive me of in, even entertaining those yeah. thoughts because he did heal her. Yeah. And I was convinced of that. Yeah. But, and, and you ended up being right. You ended up not absolutely. looking at the full. So they do the biopsy and what? Absolutely clean. Just absolutely clean. Nothing at all. So just absolutely insane. Absolutely. Yeah. So insane. we get cancer clean, cancer miraculously clean. clean. <laughs> Let's double check the triple check and yeah. clean. And so it, it really is. I mean, there have been these moments over my last 20 years here where there's just kind of this explicit miracle that outside of God, you know, who's outside of time and space, violating the very laws that he created to rule and reign for his own glory, yeah. have no explanation. I mean, this is certainly uh, up there uh, for me. And so thank you guys for being willing to kind of share the story. And we're rejoicing with you. I, I've already told you when, when the news came that this is what happened, the staff just, because we, we had prayed that Wednesday in staff prayer yeah. earnestly. Um, that the Lord would heal you. And we actually, specifically, that he would give you 10 more years together. Yeah. Uh, and so, man, it, it's crazy to think, like, like, to go from letting your kids know, hey, this looks like like we're in palliative care, that they, they, there doesn't look like there's a lot of hope here at all, to, to healing, and, and then, you know, doubling it and finding out, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely, he's healed. It's just been a, yeah. man, it's just been a, a a wind in the sails of the men and women who work here. So thanks for being willing to share it. Well, so, praise God. Yeah, amen to that. Praise God. Amen thank to you. that. Roger. Yeah. So fun. Now, I do think um, here's, I need to address this, uh, or we're not being honest. Uh, I've been here 20 years. I think probably got two, maybe three dozen of those. And I've done hundreds of funerals, hundreds of them. How are we to think well as God's people in a broken and fallen world when God does break through and, and, and seems to do so in ways that there's no natural explanation for, but not near as much as we want him to? And, and honestly, if I'm in, like in ways that like baffle us, like I'm, I'm, I'm in it with the Lord right now, uh, where I just am really wanting him to do something. And, and he's good, and I'm, I'm in that fight that I mentioned earlier where I'm, I'm like, having like, help me believe more than I do right now, do something here. And, and I'm wrestling with him, like, like okay, because that's real, isn't it? Anybody batting a thousand on miracles and healing? If so, I'll, I'll hire you right now. Like, you will be on staff this afternoon, and I've got some things I need you to do. Um, so he, here's what I thought we could do just at the end of our, um, the end of our time together. Um, when, when I was diagnosed, if you don't know, 13 years ago, I was diagnosed with um, basically terminal brain cancer. It gave me two to three years to live. And, and what happened in that space is uh, there, there was this group of people um, that put all kinds of weight on me in a way that that is sinful. And so I was sitting right here where probably Addie Autry is right now. Hey, Addie. And this young man came from over here and he's just weeping. And he sits down next to me and he gives me a hug and he says, is God going to heal you? 
And I said, man, I certainly hope so. He says, but, but do you believe that he will heal you? I was like, well, I certainly hope so. And then he just started crying harder and let me know that his uncle had told him that if I didn't believe, if I didn't have the faith to believe that God would heal me outright, then I would surely die. If anyone ever says that to you, they are a liar and a fool and you should run. Nonsensical. But then on the other side of things, if I'm, if I'm just being fair to everyone or maybe unfair to everyone, on the other side of things, there were people that were praying for me and my, my good friend, uh, John Tyson, calls it this, reverence without anticipation for an answer. You ever been prayed for by somebody when you're sick or in a lot of trouble and they, they're reverence, but they're like defending God just in case he doesn't? You ever experienced that? Like, we're going to pray quasi-boldly because if God doesn't show up, I don't want to look like a fool, and I certainly don't want God to look like he lacks power right there. Like, trying to protect God as though he's some sort of fragile thing. And, and so I think both of these approaches are, are wrong. Not only wrong, but harmful. Um, and, and so I, I loved this. Let me just show you how I think we should position ourselves under the weight of a miraculous healing God. This is Daniel 3, 17 through 18. Maybe you even know this story if you don't have a background in church. If this be so, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They're about to be thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar for not worshiping the golden idol. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Did you hear it? God's able. He can do it. Right? There's, there's posture number one. God is able. Doesn't matter what it is. He is able. It's the second one I find evangelicals have a problem with. He will heal me. I'm believing by faith. He will heal me with the attachment. But even if he doesn't. He's God, I'm not. He's eternal, I'm not. He sees perfectly, I don't. My life is his anyway. All, every day has been a gift. So he can heal me. He will heal me. And even if he doesn't, my life is his. And that's the right posture before a God who heals and does miracles. You miss any one of those three, then I think you've set yourself up to get angry at God for not doing something that he never promised you he would. You tracking with me? Yes. Okay. Let, let, me, let me end with this. In Mark 9, there's this, it's a, it's a hard, beautiful story where there's a father whose son is demonically uh, op- oppressed, maybe possessed. Um, and that is signing, the, the way that's showing itself is through a lot of suicidal ideation. He's, th- the boy will throw himself in the fire, he'll throw himself in the water. The, the boy's constantly trying to kill himself. And listen, if you have a kid, I, I can't imagine the desperation and confusion and, and fear as you've got this son that you, you have to watch incessantly because at any given moment he'll try to take his own life. So he comes to Jesus and he's like, can you, can you, will you help us? And Jesus, this starts in verse 21, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if I can All things are possible for the one who believes. And listen to this. If there's a more honest sentence in the Bible, I don't know that I've read it. And immediately the father said what? I believe. Help my unbelief. Like I wonder how many of us today, we're just in this desperate need for for God to come through in a way that only God can come through. Like we, we've already heard, like there's, there's no other options. There's nothing else. There, there's an addiction that we haven't been able to shake. There, there's some emotional trauma and brokenness that hasn't been able to be righted. There, there's, a, there's an illness that, that, that has just hounded us with no, and, and we've just kind of run out of gas. We just have lost hope. And this sentence given to us by the Holy Spirit To encourage us anew says actually the right posture is, uh, I believe, help my unbelief. So I thought we can't talk about healings and miracles without creating a little space to, like this father, 
for our own souls, for our own lives, for the lives of our family and those we love. Say, I believe, help my unbelief. So I'm going to pray for us. And there's going to be a group of men and women. In fact, they're going to already start coming up. There are our prayer team and staff and elders. And they're going to line up here. And they're going to line up against the, the sound booth back there. Because we've learned that things get a little full when we do this. And I want to invite you. Listen, if you are needing a kind of supernatural breakthrough in your life. You're needing the miracle. You're needing the healing. I just want to invite you up to be prayed over. We want to pray with you that your faith would increase and that you would receive the healing or miracle that, that, that you desire in your life. And I'm saying all that without any promises. God is God and I am not. And, and Jesus raises, or Paul raises the dead and, and, and can't heal Trophimus. But we can ask. And the Bible's pretty clear that God loves it when we ask. And I'm not, we're not bowing our heads and we're not, so I'm not making it easy. I'm making it awkward on purpose because the awkward step of faith is something God always honors. And so I'm gonna pray and then we've got, you know, we've got a little bit of time here before the end of service and we're just gonna see what the Lord would have. I would just encourage you to believe that maybe, just maybe, God might. Let me pray for us. Father, I bless these men and women in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, gosh, you, the book is full of it. Christian history is full of it. You, you know us, you see us, you know it's scary to be us. You say that Jesus is an empathetic high priest. And so for those who have come in today with the crushing weight of this or that, I just pray in your mercy that you would meet them, that you would supernaturally heal, that you would grant the miracle, that you would um, show off not for the sign itself, not for the miracle, but to the sign that it points to, the reign and rule of Jesus, the beauty of his kingdom. We need your help. Help us. Through your beautiful name I pray. Amen.